Hi everyone, can we just have a sound check, make sure everything's okay? Yes, okay, okay. Everything's okay.
Good morning. Morning. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Oh, it's, it's fine. So uh, shall we start? Sure, 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 sure. Okay, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Dr. Falahat, Chairperson of Utah Center for Entrepreneurial Sustainability. On behalf of Utah, I would like to warmly welcome all of you to our webinar in Titan. What does it mean to be social capitalist? Today, we are pleased and honored to host Tatu Dr. Vinod Shekhar, Chairman and Chief Executive of Petra Group. Very short introduction about Tatu Vinod. Tatu is the Chairman and Chief Executive of Petra Group, which is the global conglomerate involved in sustainable industries with the one common goal providing solution for humanity. Petra Group's businesses ranging from manufacturing, modular building construction, green rubber technology, rail transit system, agriculture, media, entertainment, and lifestyle, all the way to research and many more. As an advocate for social capitalism, the two we not believe that business interest and societal concern should go hand in hand, which act as the basis of Petra Group. He believes that enterprises should be run as a profitable ventures while doing the right thing for employees, customers, society and environment to ensure sustainable wealth creation and equitable income generation for all. He is the founder of the Vinod Schenker Foundation, the un which undertakes various initiatives to alleviate poverty, provide healthcare and education, and support the most vulnerable community, including indigenous, disabled, old folks, children, refugees, and hardcore poor. Dr. Vinod, thank you very much for accepting our invitation out of your busy schedule to be here today. Now, without further ado, let's turn the time over to Datu Vinod Schenker. Datu Vinod, over to you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I will try, try not disappoint and talk about uh, social capitalism in a way that perhaps people can appreciate and understand uh, where I'm coming from. Um, perhaps the best way to start is for me to uh, give you all my life's journey uh, up, to, up to now in, in the shortest uh, period I can. Um, I actually uh, went to college in America, I went to school in England. Um, my father was a senior rubber scientist and palm oil scientist. He headed the Malaysian Rubber Board, uh, the Rubber Research Institute of Malaysia and the Palm Oil Research Institute. Um, unfortunately, he was not rich. Uh, he was one of the straightest individuals I know. Uh, 
more integrity than I've seen anyone else have. But that meant one problem when he uh, was out of government, uh, or out of uh, the civil service, there was no way I, as the youngest child of four, uh, could afford to go to college uh, overseas. Uh, I suddenly found myself in a position of needing a scholarship to go to finish my boarding school in the UK, and then getting another scholarship to go to the US to study, which I did. I, uh, I managed to get a scholarship from Singapore. Uh, I finished my boarding school. I got another scholarship to go to, uh, to, uh, to university. Um, most people think that uh, my wealth is inherited or what I have now is inherited. It was not. My father retired with his pension and his EPF, and that's about it. So um, from the age of about 19 or 18, I pretty much had to figure out how to um, ensure that, that things were covered. Um, the strength I had was my father's reputation and his integrity because that gave was more powerful than money, uh, quite frankly. I am sure that, you know, one of the major aspects of me getting the scholarship was who I was the son of uh, that helped um, along the way. Anyway, I went to uh, college uh, and, you know, if you're a, many of you, I'm sure, understand as students, uh, not much money um, to really enjoy yourself. I, my scholarship covered room and board and tuition, uh, but nothing else. So I had to figure out how I was going to earn money to have fun. And, you know, I insisted on having fun. I mean, I work very hard, but I like my beer and I like to have fun. So it was a question of how was I going to do it. As a foreign student, all I was allowed to do officially was either work in the college cafeteria or the college bookshop. Uh, that was it. That was the only two places I was allowed to work in. No, sorry, college library or the college cafeteria, both which were for minimum wage, would have been covered two pints of beer if I wanted to a week. So I was looking for different things to do. Uh, I then came across an idea to make shirts with college crests in the pocket. Um, I had a friend who was uh, whose father uh, had a textile company in uh, Coimbatore, India, I believe. Uh, I convinced him to ask his father whether they could make me some samples. I had $50. I gave the $50 and got 10 samples. I became a designer. Designer meaning, you know, white shirt, red stripes, white shirt, yellow stripes, pink shirt, blue shirt with the college crest. So that was the totality of my design skills. Uh, and I'm colorblind. So <laughs> but that says a lot. Um, I used that. I got the samples and I went to all the different universities in the region of Pennsylvania and I managed to get one who agreed to buy uh, 350, which is more than I, I was shocked because I just wanted to make pocket money. Um, and so I managed to convince the lady manager to uh, buy it from me, pay 50% down, which allowed me to buy the rest. So the, the numbers were, it cost me six US dollars to buy packed and ready from India. I sold it to them for 12 US dollars and they sold it for $38.95. So now next time you buy some high fashion uh, shirt or dress, remember how much it actually costs uh, to make. Um, so anyway, that's how I started my business. That, that gave me this rise to keep doing something. That business grew faster than I could imagine. Uh, I was learning on my feet. I mean, I was studying biology. So, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, biologist pretending to be a businessman here at the stage. Uh, but I learned fast and uh, it grew. I used my friends in different colleges around the country to do the same. I gave them a cut uh, and that company grew. Uh, by the time I came back four years later, I sold that company to a major U.S. corporation for 20 million U.S. dollars. And that's my journey. You know how we just grew. I decided to... Uh, drop everything and come back home and carry on with the business because I, I enjoyed creating things. I enjoyed building things up. At that moment, I'd already started my foundation uh, and we helped two children uh, along the way. Of course, now we are helping several thousand in different manners and hundreds of thousands of, of people indirectly. Uh, but we started with two uh, back then. I was, I guess, 20 at that stage. Um, now, I think it's important to understand where my view of money comes from, uh, because one of, the, one of the things that people always throw at me is that I don't seem to have a respect for money. I do, but, you know, I spend it, I give it away, I, I, 
you know, I, I don't think too much about it. Um, but let me tell you why. When I was 16, um, around 16, I'd been back from boarding school and my mother was the deputy chairman of the Spastic Children's Association uh, in, in KL Slango. And every two weeks, they should have a meeting, either the governor's meeting or some other meeting at the center in PJ. And I would go with her and I would play with the kids or do something. It was a Saturday and uh, while she had a meeting. I would go there, I'd take my wallet, I'd put it on a workstation and I'd go play with the kids uh, who were there for the, for the weekend or for the day or whatever. Uh, after the second visit, I noticed I was missing some money from my wallet, five ringgit, 10 ringgit, one ringgit notes. And it was bothering me. You know, I, I could understand why I was missing this money. And the third one, I'm missing again. So I remember being really angry, telling my mother, no, this, what's the point of helping people if all they do is steal? You know, I go there to help people and just, just take my money. And my mother tried to calm me down, said, darling, don't worry, it's, it's only money, it's all right, don't worry. And I was like determined to find out who was taking my money. And I told her, okay, this was my last visit before I was going to go back to boarding school. So I said, I'm going to find out, I'm going to confront people, I'm going to find out who's taking my money. Anyway, I arrived there. And along the way, I, I had become very friendly with a, a Down syndrome young boy called Philip. Uh, he was, oh gosh, I can't remember now. He was either 9, 10, or 11 years old, uh, around then, uh, around that age. And um, let's just say 10. Um, and he, when I arrived, ready to confront everyone, he just jumped at me and says, oh, if you know, if you're not come with me, I got something for you. So before I could say anything to anybody, he dragged me to his workstation. So I followed him. And at his workstation, he had this manila card, you know, this poster, a uh, big poster card. Uh, on the on, on his workstation and he had these magazines and he was cutting up these pictures in these magazines and he was sticking them on this manila card and he was creating me a poster as a going away present because he knew it was my last Saturday before I was leaving and he wanted to give me a present and he had been sticking and creating this 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 poster this uh, this picture for me then I looked at this manila card and at the cutouts and all that stuck on the manila card and then I noticed you know, one ringgit, five ringgit, and 10 ringgit notes all cut up and stuck. He looked at me and said, I ran out of colored pieces of paper. I hope you don't mind. I borrowed some of yours. So it took a 10-year-old Down syndrome kid to remind me that it was a colored piece of paper. That's all it was. You know, I was so angry over colored pieces of paper. We kill for it. We hate for it. We die for it, we blame others for it, we cheat for it, we steal. I mean, my God, we do lots of things over what is essentially a colored piece of paper. And that's all he saw. And that's all it is. I felt this small, <laughs> you know, this pathetic, this small uh, at that moment, uh, because he knew more about life and the world than I did at that moment. Um, and from that day, that's how I treated money. It's important. It's a tool. It's like your chair. You sit on it. It's an important thing to sit on a chair. But if you don't have a chair, you sit on the floor. It's just a tool. It will never control me. It'll never direct. It'll never tell me what to do. I tell it what to do. I direct it. Um, and I think that's a very important thing to keep in your head. That all it is, is a tool. Colored piece of paper, whatever currency. Important. It's a tool, a very important tool, like computer, anything else. Let's you do a lot of things but it must never control you. It must never direct you. It must never lead your soul, right? It, it's, it's just another tool. And that's, that's the basis of, of, of how I went into business after that and what I wanted to do, why I started the foundation uh, so early on that grew. Um, and that's the, I, I suppose, the formative period of what I call now social capitalism. Um, but it started then as to, you know, we, we in business cannot just disengage from society or from societal development. We are part and parcel of the community. Uh, we make money off the community. We supply to the community. If the community is healthy, so are we. Um, and the days, I believe, of, of companies businessmen, businesswomen, just saying, no, no, you know, we're not involved in society. You know, uh, we deal with the government, we pay taxes, that's it, uh, is gone. 
we have to be integrally involved in society, in the community. Um, and I learned many lessons as I was going on. I'll come back to this later because you know there are lessons to learn. Uh, I was I was very lucky. I was a millionaire at twenty one. I was a multimillionaire at twenty four. By then, I'd started Southeast Asia's first commercial internet company. I'd created the smallest optic engine. I privatized the second largest petrochemical refinery in Europe. By the age of 25, I owned an F1, F2000, F3 team before anyone else did. Uh, and I was 26 at that moment. Uh, I was a Dato uh, 26, the youngest in Malaysia at that stage, in Malaysian history at that stage. Um, so you can imagine what happens, right? Everyone is telling you you're the best thing since sliced bread. And this is one of the other problems. You know, when you start believing your own bullshit, <laughs> I mean, excuse my language, but, you know, uh, everyone is telling you how great you are and you start believing it. Everyone, you know, I was the, at that stage, this is the pre-internet era, right? I mean, I just started that internet company in Malaysia, but it's, uh, there were 700 internet users when I started, 700, believe it or not. Uh, I grew, sold that company for a lot of money, but, you know, at that stage, it was all still printed, you know, Far East Economic Review, Asia Week, Fortune thing. And I was on the cover of these magazines. I was, you know, everyone is telling me I was, you know, how brilliant I was. I was the whiz kid, you know, and you start believing your own crap. This is, you know, you, you think you're untouchable and then you get touched. Um, and, you know, just like that, you, you think you can do everything because everyone says you can and you go into areas that you have no business going into. I mean, I went into East Asia's largest fruit and vegetable farm into the first major sports car into, into things I had no business going into. I'm a technologist. I understand technology. I understand communication. I understand certain things. Uh, and so when the Asian financial crisis, and you're all too young to remember this, but there was a period called the Asian financial crisis in 1998. This was uh, uh, the year after Anwar Ibrahim was, uh, was jailed, uh, was arrested. Uh, 1998, where basically the world came to a stop as far as Southeast Asia was concerned. Um, the stock market collapsed from 1,000, I guess, 250 to 270 points. Uh, the ringgit went from $2.50 to one ringgit, uh, $1 to nearly $5. Uh, everything doubled up. Uh, if you borrowed, you know, a million dollars and you thought you had 2.5 million ringgit, you actually now owed 5 million ringgit. Interest rates went from 6%, 5% to 12.9%. So, Everything was, I mean, it was, it was a joke. There's nothing you could do. But on top of all that, I had these companies that, you know, I just run and I thought I could do, but I had no expertise and I had no understanding of it. And most importantly, I had no passion for, really no passion for. It was just another thing someone said I should do. Because after all, I'm the whiz kid, right? So I do it, it should work. Everything I touch turns to gold. Uh, well, that was not the case. You know, when things collapse, everything collapses. And you learn your lesson there when you understand that, you know, you don't do anything unless you're passionate about it. And if you're passionate about it, then you know what it's about. You know how the business works. You understand where it needs to go. And when you can do that, then even in the worst of times, you know how to save it. You know how to build it up. You know how to pr protect it. Uh, and you know how to move forward. And uh, that was a very, very important lesson I learned that, you know, uh, Understanding and passion are key to being an entrepreneur. Too many entrepreneurs feel they want to be an entrepreneur and you ask them why, because I want to be rich. <laughs> you know, I want to make money. But what do you want to do? Oh, I, just, you know, I don't know, I want to do something. It doesn't work that way. True entrepreneurship is about having a passion for something, believing in something, whatever it is, and then going forward with it because you believe in it. And I think that's a critical element of being an entrepreneur. Um, I think it's a critical element in life in general, whatever you do, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're an accountant, uh, whether you're an engineer, you must be passionate about it. You must really want to do it. And if you're passionate about it, you will rise. And here's the thing about passion. Passion gives you tenacity, right? And tenacity is, is, is one of those things that will keep you going because you need passion and tenacity to be successful because you will fall, right? We, we all fall. Uh, and, and anyone that says, oh, we don't fail, we don't fall, bullshit, we all fail, all right? I, I, failure is our lessons, okay? You, you take failures as very, very important lessons. Uh, you just don't do the same lesson twice. If you're gonna fail again, you fail at something completely different. I have multiple PhDs in failure, okay? So uh, failure is a very important part of life. Hopefully your failures are smaller rather than larger, but it is, these are le lessons that are very, very critical. 
Uh, and it's through those failures that you grow. Now, when you have tenacity, it doesn't matter how many times you fall, you keep getting up. If you fall again, you get up again and you keep walking because there's no choice. If you're passionate and you're tenacious, you just get up and you keep walking. And I promise you, if you keep doing that, you will succeed. You know, my father taught me that good guys win. Takes a bit longer sometimes, hurts a bit more sometimes. But ultimately, if you can remain the good guy, you will always win. Now, the question is, can you remain the good guy when everyone is attacking you, when your soul is trying to be bored? Uh, and I've been tested so many times. I mean, you know, many of you know that I'm Anwar Ibrahim's close friend. I'm a supporter of reform in this country. I've supported the opposition previously for the last 20 something years. But there's a price to pay for that when you're a businessman. People attack you. I'm constantly attacked. There's always something. Why? Because I'm a businessman that won't bow. I'm a businessman that won't follow the narrative of what businesses in Malaysia should do, that we should out to the, to the powers that be. We should not comment on socioeconomic issues. We should not comment on democracy. We should not comment uh, on, on things that, that we believe in because that's not what we do. We make money and that's it. Well, that's wrong. Uh, I will never do that. Uh, and I'll pay the price for it. Uh, but you know what? If someone at my level, at my wealth, is not willing to stand up, then what's the point? You know? So I'll take the punches. I'll take the, the fake news and the stories people try to spread around. And it happens, happens recently, it keeps happening. Uh, but here's the thing. When you don't sell your soul and you don't back down and you move forward, you will win. I'm your prime example. Uh, having an entire federal government under Najib that tried to take me down because I was a supporter of the opposition and the only, at that time, the only senior businessman that would, um, you know, you pay the price. I paid the price, but I wouldn't back down and you keep growing. So good guys do win. You just have to remain the good guy. You just have to fight through it. Um, and, and in business, it's critical because can I tell you something? Businesses and businessmen are I think they're the smartest people in the room. They, they can change the world. It's like we have a, a, a duck, a dying duck, okay? We businessmen and businesswomen have the smartest accountants in the world that will, re, will fix the bones and the arteries of the duck, and pump new blood through. Then we have the best lawyers in the world that will now check it all out, legally say, well, this duck is no longer dying. It's healthy and well. And then we have the best communications people, PR people, that will now show the world not only is this formerly uh, dying duck healthy and well, it's thriving and laying golden eggs, right? Now, if you imagine, if you could take a small percentage of that ingenuity, just a small percentage, and used it to fix a society problem, fix an issue in the community, imagine what's possible. And I think that's what social capitalism is about, right? I make money by selling you a product, you a service. How do I make more money? I need more of you. How do I get more of you? I need to push people out of poverty into the middle class. Because here's the thing, I want your money, but I need you to have it before I can take it from you, right? It's selfish. But that's how social capitalism works. It's sustainable wealth creation. And that's key, sustainable wealth creation. You can't just gouge at something because that will cannibalize your own market and everything just collapses. You have to build, you have to create. And when you do that, when, when you play a role in your community, when you play a role in an environment that you are actually working in and it becomes healthy and it's thriving, your business does better. You have more market. It's healthier, it's stronger, it's more long-term and you can keep growing and the others grow with you. And it keeps doing that. That's social capitalism. You know? And that's the way the world needs to work because you know, it's not about greed. Uh, being bad or good. Greed is neither good nor bad. Greed is just greed. It's there. Whether we like it or not, we're greedy for love, we're greedy for food, we're greedy for, for, for work, for ambition, for money, we're greedy for lots of different things. Um, so it's just there. It's, 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 a, it's a human affect that's, that exists. It's like owning a powerful Bugatti sports car, right? This powerful sports car, not to 60 and I don't know, three seconds or less. Now, if you can't drive it well, You'll crash into a tree and kill yourself, or you'll crash into someone else and kill them. But if you can control it, if you know how to take the curve, slow down on the curves, stop at junctions, 
accelerate on the straights, then you have control over a very, very powerful engine. And that's what greed is, a powerful engine. If you can temper it, then you, have, you can do almost anything. You can achieve almost anything. But you've got to temper that greed. And in simplistic terms, what can you do for 10 ringgit that you can't do for eight? What can you do for 100 ringgit that you can't do for 80? What can you do for 10 million that you can't do with 8 million? Then when you look at it that way, then you take that 2 million or that 20 ringgit or that 200 ringgit and you use it in your community. You use it for your employees or you use it to help a friend or you use it to do something good that enhances another life, another community. You actually have enhanced much more than that. Because when you help one person, that person affects many others. When you help one community, that one community affects many others. So when, when someone tells me, oh, I don't have enough, you know, I don't, I don't have enough wealth to give. It's not about wealth. Time, give your time. Maybe you don't have enough money every month for more than yourself, for your family. But maybe you have, I don't know, a, a Sunday morning free every week. And your neighbor's child is a smart, smart student, but struggling with Bahasa or struggling with English. Maybe you teach English for that one child uh, every Sunday. And that changes that child's life and his potential of what that child can achieve. In different ways, you do what you can. And that's the key, right? Do what you can. It's not about how much. Just do something. Now imagine if everyone did something, how the world will change. Right, so I'm not a hypocrite. I, I, I like all the toys. I have lots of toys. I've got a yacht, I've got nice cars, I've got all the toys I want. That's, I worked hard, I want my toys. But that's not the point. If you're smart enough to have toys, then you're smart enough to lift others. You're smart enough to, as you grow, bring others with you. You're smart enough to try and find solutions for problems. So social capitalism is not about denying yourself the, the toys or the life you want. It's about ensuring because you're smart enough to do that, you're smart enough to look at people around you and lift people up. You're smart enough to find solutions for problems that exist in your community that others don't have a way of solving. You're smart enough to share a little bit of what you have to make life better for one other person. I can tell you people who talk to me and I, I, we've donated a, a mobile hospital. We, we've spent money on feeding nearly 3 million people in the last one and a half years of this pandemic. Uh, and they ask me, well, what a sacrifice you must make. <laughs> Let me be very clear. I've sacrificed nothing. I've given up nothing. The amount of money we've spent, which is substantial on helping others, hasn't impacted the life I lead or the life my executives lead. Uh, and that's the truth. Um, so why shouldn't we do it? What is the point of just accumulated wealth that achieves nothing? Uh, when this actually enhances communities and lifts communities, which will, in the end, bring uh, more funds to me that will bring more profit in the long term. It's a selfish thing. It all works together. And that's what social capitalism is about. Again, it's sustainable wealth creation. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, can't, we can't take away the value system that we must have in all this. You know, we, 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 we can't take away the humanity uh, in business. Uh, the, again, as I said, the days of economic leaders, business leaders saying that I'm not involved in, you know, I'm not dealing with what community and societal involvement are, that's CSR, and I consider CSR dirty work because that's a box ticking exercise. We need to get it into the lifeblood of a company that the community that they're working in is part and parcel of everything they do. Uh, lifting people up within their companies, helping employees and their families, is part and parcel of everything they do. Uh, and we need to make it part of everything. When we do that, we change this world. And uh, I think we can, I believe we can. And then you come to climate change. That's a big subject now. And again, you need businesses, you need small economic enterprise, small and medium-sized enterprise to be part of all this. Because you first, no point saving the planet if you're gonna kill people, right? You need to save people. We need to deal with poverty, we need to deal with education. We need to be able to help society grow because the poor don't understand why they need to be involved with climate change issues. So if we want to fix climate change, we need to educate them to say that this is why it impacts them. 
This is why climate change impacts their, their fishing, it impacts their farms, impacts their ability to earn a living for their family. At the same time, when we're dealing with the climate change issues from a scientific level, we have to include holistically the issue of poverty, malnutrition, education. So it's not a simple thing that we just fix this and not this. We have to fix it all. We have to find a way of bringing it all together and making it work. Otherwise, we're just talking nonsense and speaking and speaking at every conference and achieving nothing. We have to be pragmatic, we have to be realistic and then work out what we need to do. It's not gonna be easy. Um, I'm committed to trying my best. I'm not saying I'll achieve it, but I will keep trying. And you know, maybe that's what we all need to do is just keep trying. We keep trying, you know, one thing succeeds, it might change everything. Um, and that's what I'd ask you all to do, is to look at social capitalism as, as something that should be a way of life. It's a way of how we think. It, it doesn't fight human, human nature. And I don't want to fight human nature. You know, um, so, social, I, I was called a social capitalist by Fidel Castro. Um, and it was my basis that I believe that everyone should have a minimum. And the minimum should be a full stomach, a full head, and a roof over your head healthy life. It didn't matter if you have to live in a dormitory, but you must have three meals a day. And you must have access to education if you want it. After that, it should be a free-for-all. But society is rich enough to make sure that everyone has at least that. Now, if you want to be a billionaire, millionaire, you want to be a doctor, engineer, whatever, go ahead. But we as a community, as a, as, as a society, as a people, must accept that we can no longer live in this ridiculous situation where we have simultaneous epidemics of obesity and starvation. I mean, it's ridiculous, sometimes in the same country. How, how nonsensical is that? Too much food and too little food, <laughs> okay? So we have to accept these realities and say, look, this is all too stupid. We're too smart to allow this to carry on. We have to fix this. And so these are the challenges I put forward to all of you. Um, I put to myself to try and, 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 uh, and do what I can. Uh, and as I said, when you do things like this, there will be haters, there will be people that will try to tear you down because you know, you, you, you'll be standing above others. You'll be you're standing up and showing yourself and saying, this must be done because that's leadership, right? Leadership is standing up. But when you stand up, people try to tear you down. People try to poke at you now. Yo political in nature, then they will try to poke you politically. Uh, Business-wise, they'll try to poke you business. But you have to stand firm and stand tall. Believe in yourself, believe in what you're doing, and just keep walking. Remember, passion and tenacity. With that, you can achieve almost anything. I think I've spoken enough, and uh, perhaps I'd like to let you guys ask me some questions if I can answer anything for all of you. But thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful sharing session. So uh, let me open to uh, Q&A. If any of our students or colleagues have any question, please uh, write it in the chat box and I'll be ready for uh, the Tukwino. Just while we are waiting for the students, let me uh, just summarize what we have learned so far. So we have learned that, you know, two key takeaways, talking about the passion, to be passionate about what you are doing in business and also tenacity. Despite you are, you know, if in case you fail, you need to consider that you need to, uh, you know, to be, um, you know, to 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 come back and also, uh, since you have a passionate about that particular business that you are doing, you can actually be hardworking and continue with that matter. Uh, don't chase money, and uh, as long as you take care of the society, and you will you will win and you will earn enough money. And besides that, talking about the look into the fixing issue related to the society, just don't just look into the profitability of your business without considering the uh, society and matter related to the uh, human and humanity. As another point related to the social capitalism is talking about the all about the sustainable wealth creation. Uh, don't again, you know, look into earning money, look into how you can create a wealth for the society, because if the people within your society don't have enough money, how you can actually earn money from them. So you need to help them to grow. And this is the uh, key success factor of our that we know that share with all of us. And with regards to the CSR that we know and we are aware, 
many of multinational company go through the procedure of just come up with some sort of activity related to CSR that we not believe we need to go beyond that. We need to look into the employees. We need to look into their families. We need to see how we can solve their problem, how we can look into the poverty, how we can educate and how we can go beyond the CSR and helping the society. So uh, that's uh, what I could summarize so far. So we are going to open uh, for Q&A. If anybody have any question, please feel free to write your question in the chat box. Uh, perhaps I may ask one question. I, uh, we all aware that you are a very successful businessman. Uh, we would like, and also we know that you are very, uh, you know, family oriented. We would like to know how you actually balance the life between your family and the business that you. <laughs> not easy. Trust me, it's not easy. But uh, one of the key things is is surrounding yourself with people smarter than you. A lot of leaders, a lot of business leaders have a problem. They, they think they're the smartest people, so they must do everything. And they must be in the middle of everything and they must decide everything and everyone else doesn't understand that. Um, I've gone the opposite way. I, I, I look at my capabilities and these are lessons learned. I, mean, I didn't just know this one. These are from hard lessons learned in my 20s and 30s. You know, you, you learn as you go along. Uh, you, you look at your gaps. You must first realize your weaknesses. That's the key. Key to leadership is understanding yourself. Once you know your weaknesses, then you know the holes you have, then you know what you need to fill. You know what you need to surround yourself with for the gaps that you have. So what I've done is I've surrounded myself with people that fill the gaps I believe I have, that I listen to. And the most important thing is to listen, right? You, you, you can't just go in there and say, no, I'm right. This is what I want to do. You have smart people that you listen to them. Now, they, you listen to them, you let them debate you, then you decide. That's your leadership. That's what leadership is. They don't decide. You decide but after listening to everyone, because you're the biggest winner or loser in anything. So therefore, data, information is critical. If you cut off data, if you stop people from sharing with you what they're thinking, you're just basically shooting yourself. Because what you want is information. You take that information and you use it, you decide, well, this is not relevant for this, this is relevant for that. You know, and, and I've always told my, 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 my team, we must play chess, not checkers. Life, business, everything, education is chess, not checkers. It's not what's right in front of you. It's not the exam you're doing tomorrow. It's winning the whole board, right? That means sometimes you sacrifice a bishop, sometimes you sacrifice a castle, sometimes you have a few pawns that fall apart, but it's the strategy to win the whole board. And that's where your mind must be. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's what I've done. And with that, by doing that, because I have such able executives and colleagues, it allows me to spend time with my family. And, and you have to understand how critical that is. Without spending time with my family, I am, I am not the person I am. You know, without that, that break with my friends, with my family, having those holidays, having, talking to them, spending time with them, I would not be able to achieve what I've achieved. It gives you a sense of balance and it gives you a clarity of thought as to what is important in life. And I think being, being a business person, you have to come to terms with what is important in life. What do you want your life to be about? You know, what do you want it to represent? And for me, you know, I'd like, you know, when I'm gone, for my children to be able to see, well, that's what my dad represented. And he spent time with me to explaining to me, sharing with me, because then you leave another generation with your ideals and your hopes. And maybe they take it forward, make it bigger, better do more. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we have a question over here. Uh, capitalist companies always aim for increasing revenue and profit. Is that a good or bad thing? Let's, let's, let's go back to what I said. Companies are about profit. We must now talk about definitions. We have to get companies to understand that there is profit beyond cash. And the value of your company must not just be on its cash profit. Profit must be much more than just the cash. It must be about how you take care of your colleagues, how you take care of your employees, how you take care of the environment you're in, how you take care of the community you're in. And I think once you do that, 
then other companies, and already, it's already happening, fund managers, uh, hedge funds will all look at you and value you differently. Because they will look at it and say, yeah, you made 8 million instead of 10 million because you used uh, 2 million to go help your community and all that. But in helping your community, oh, you created a school, you created this, you've enhanced their lives, you've given scholarships. Now there are more people that can afford more things. So really, you know, your PE should be higher, your price earnings should be higher, and therefore your value of your company is much more than a company that just made 8, 10 million in cash. And you can already see that happening. And that's what, we'll, that's what we need to do. So um, for me, it's, it's definitions of what profit is. And that's what we have to change, defining what profit is. So for true capitalist companies and true capitalism, true capitalism is again, sustainable wealth creation. And the sustainability part and the creation part is what we have to focus on. It's not just enough that I, I just make money, I take $10 and I walk away, mm -hmm. right? If I want to make more money, I want to enhance that, I need to spend money on the community I'm in, in whatever way I can. And each company will have a different format, right? Whether it's to help your employees, help you know single mothers in your company, help the school in your community, help the environment uh, that your, your factory is in, it's all different and each one has to do their own thing. So I think the key is to just look at profit beyond cash. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have another question is asking how concerned is Malaysian business leaders in embracing their CSR in tackling societal problem, climate change and poverty. So how actually Malaysian companies taking this seriously? Um, I think there are many companies taking very seriously and there are many companies that don't give a damn. And there are some companies in between not knowing really what they should do. Uh, it's a process. Everything is a process. So you need leadership in this, right? You need governments to put in uh, more stringent rules where, where necessary, because sometimes companies need to be told, you know, you can do this. Sometimes you need incentives to get companies to do certain things. And again, government plays an important role there. Uh, in other cases, I think you have companies that actually believe in this and will do what they need to do to make, to make a difference. Uh, I think what you will find is more and more Malaysian companies are stepping up to the plate. Uh, climate change is not something we can ignore at all. Uh, and my only addition to that is that it cannot be just climate change. It has to be poverty eradication. It has to be education. Uh, otherwise, we won't fix the problem. Uh, so that combination is what's important. And I think a lot of companies are now stepping up to pay. Some because they're being shamed into it because other companies are doing it, they can't. And that's fine, you know what? Whatever it takes uh, to get companies to change and move forward. I am not, I mean, the word corporate social responsibility is a good word, but what's happened now is CSR be has become a box ticking exercise and that's what has to evolve. And that's why I think social capitalism is what we need to move to which is that it becomes the lifeblood of a company. This is how they operate. It's not about just ticking a box. This is what they do holistically. Uh, that's much more important than planting a thousand trees and then forgetting about it. But just, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's gotta be much more than that. Um, but it's a work in progress. Uh, to be not, I, I have another question with regards to the uh, social capitalist. So um, whether your company have any collaboration with any university in Malaysia to, to look into the, those matters related to the, you know, the, uh, taking care of the society or come up with any sort of project that they can do the collaboration with university? Not yet. I would love to. We are already, uh, you talked to Professor Kendall, we are already uh, working with uh, UK, a major UK university that wants to now study social capitalism and ask us to play a role uh, in that process. And yeah, I mean, Malaysia, I love my country. I live here. It doesn't matter all the nonsense that goes on. It doesn't matter all the crap that I have to take uh, because of my friendship with certain politicians. I, you know, I, uh, I believe in my country. I believe this is the best country in the world. You know, um, I believe that there is no other nation as multiracial, multireligious, uh, multilingual uh, like this nation of ours. You know, we are blessed with everything. It's just that uh, we've allowed our politics to get out of hand. And we've allowed uh, greed to be untempered. So, but I think the potential, and especially with the younger generation, is amazing what can be achieved. So, yeah, I mean, I'd be very up. Uh, we've not done anything with any university in Malaysia, uh, yeah. but I'd be very up for it.
Yeah, in, in Utah, we have actually many uh, research centers actually working in those uh, sort of line of research. So perhaps we can communicate with your company to see what we can do in the future. So, well, uh, Professor Graham Kendall, you, you know, he's a CEO of the Good Capitalism Forum. That's all about our, our views. So definitely work with him. Sure. Thank you very much. I, I think we have covered all the questions. So we need to, uh, um, before we end the session, we would like everyone to turn on the camera. So Actually, before, I, before I think, one of the things I would like you yes. to think about is that we are looking to work with someone on polling, you know, scientific polling, because I think information and data is one of the key elements for educating a society and for making people be involved to understand what's going on there. There's too much fake news. There's too much nonsense. You know, too much of our news sites are controlled by one political party or another or political individual, and they're doing whatever they want to do to, uh, to, to, to fix their narratives. And the public should have clarity in terms of what is going on. And I think polling, scientific polling, so that everyone understands where the nation is and politicians understand where the nation actually is, that, you know, perhaps they're less concerned about race-based economics and they're more concerned about, hello, just tell us how you feed us, tell us how we can make money. I mean, these sort of information is important. And, and I think scientific polling is a key part of that. So that's maybe something we should talk about, seeing how- Yeah, I think this is a great to know. You know, that's okay. you know, right now, in, in not only in Malaysia, all around the world, there is a gap between industry and universities. Uh, we, as an academician, we are too busy with the research. We are not uh, aware what is going on within the industry. And we are very, you know, appreciate to get the feedback from industry, what we can do and how we can collaborate in order when we go for the conferences or when we train our students, at least we are in line with what actually industry require and industry needed. So really appreciate your presence over here. And we hope that we can collaborate in the future. And uh, thank you very much, everyone. So I would like everybody to turn on your camera and stand by. We would like to have a group picture as a memory for this event. Okay, so I believe they are uh, taking the uh, pictures up. Is everyone ready? We'll give them about one more minute to get ready. Stand by. Smile. One, two, three. Smile. Another one. One, two, three. Smile. And can we have a freestyle? <laughs> one, two, three. Freestyle. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that would be not. Is there anything else you would like to cover before we wrap it up? No, I'm. I I would tell all your students, uh, all of you, if if you have any questions for me, feel free to write and ask. Uh, I'm sure they can give you my email address or contact, and I'm happy to, you know, communicate and uh, you know have this conversation more because you guys represent a generation that is critical. Uh, we screwed up. My generation completely screwed up. Okay, and I'm doing my best to try and do something to at least prepare you guys to go fix it, to leave you something that you guys can, can fix. But really, you guys have to fix it. You guys will have to be the ones that take this forward, take this nation forward, take everything forward. Um, with my apologies that our generation just screwed up like crazy, uh, politically and, and, and environmentally in every other way. Um, but, you know, I think there's a tremendous opportunity uh, there's a tremendous opportunity for leadership to come in from all of you uh, and believe in yourselves. You know, I, I, I think you, you have so much out there, so much potential, and you have so many opportunities. Uh, just look at it and see how to, how to move forward. And I'd be happy to, to hear from you guys at any time. Great. 
once again, thank you very much, Dato Binot, for, the, for this insightful webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. We will see you next time. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you.